Early on February 29, 2004, the President of Haiti called upon the international community to protect his government from a rebel army advancing on the capital, Port-au-Prince. Hours later, however, President Jean-Bertrand Aristide found himself on a U.S. military jet, surrounded by Marines, being escorted to an unknown destination. Back in Haiti, hundreds of members of his party and cabinet were arrested and imprisoned. More than a year later, as he watches the last remaining months of his term expire, Aristide remains defiant towards those he says forced him into exile for the second time in 15 years. I am still the only elected president of Haiti. They voted for a president. A good number, unfortunately, were killed for that, for defending an elected president. C'est la première fois dans l'histoire du monde qu'un chef d'État élu démocratiquement élu d'un pays souverain est kidnappé par les forces spéciales de notre État souverain. President Aristide told me uh, that he'd been forced uh, from his home, that he had literally been kidnapped. They told him if he did not leave, he would be killed, and a lot of other Haitians would be killed. Every time the Haitian majority has been allowed to go to the polls, it has voted for the same people with the same agenda. Each time that agenda was pursued, the government was overthrown by military force. Aristide represented a people's reform movement and was trying for the first time ever in Haitian history to be the voice of the voiceless. This was again the Haitian people in power with all the warts and all the sloppiness and anarchy that come with a, a newly born government. As we attempt to understand how a president so overwhelmingly elected by his people lost the support of the international community, we are confronted by those who defend Aristide and accuse the United States of orchestrating his removal. This is not a, about uh, anything but the ideology of the far right wing that now really controls the United States government that does not support popular democracy. Orders from on high are that we are to concentrate on this question. Just how much was Aristide responsible? But we don't have to follow the orders from on high. And if we're sensible, we see that the only question was how it would implode. But we are also confronted by those who blame the collapse on Aristide himself. There wasn't any question that things were going to fall apart in Haiti. The immediate roots are part of the tragedy of Aristide. This man failed to deliver. Hopes crashed. President Aristide didn't just make mistakes, he willfully misgoverned and eventually he paid the price for that because he lost uh, his ability to control the whirlwind of violence that he had unleashed on the country for a decade. As the bitterly partisan debate about one of the most controversial figures of the 20th century continues to rage, it remains clear that Haiti is in crisis. I saw things that people are never supposed to see, uh, that just inhuman bodies that you just see. I mean, their daily life is to walk by a body that's being eaten by a dog because it was killed, you know, the night before. It's a setback that's, that's multiple decades backwards. Everything's broken, um, and everybody knows it. Aristide was not perfect, but he represented an institution. If allowed to grow and prosper, it symbolized another relationship that Haiti would have to the world. The justice that Aristide fought for, that the Haitian people demand, is still existing. Haiti is poor as dirt. Children are still dying. It is, the, the situation of Haiti defies logic. To see the Haitian people living like that is incredible. My hair is standing on the back of my head right now as I'm talking to you. This is such a waste. This is so indignified. This is a crime against humanity.
je connais Aristide depuis 1982, et au moment où il a été ordonné prêtre. Et j'ai suivi son évolution, son engagement dans la théologie de la libération, et aux côtés bon, des jeunes. While Father Gir Poulard came to oppose Aristide's presidency and now serves a small wealthy parish in Jacmel, he recalls his former colleague's commitment to social change. Après euh, plus de 20 ans de dictature et du valériste, euh, la population haïtienne aspirait à autre chose. Moi, je sentais en lui un homme qui était euh, animé pas seulement de bonne volonté, mais qui, qui était pris, on dirait, par les problèmes de son peuple. Dr. Paul Farmer, an American physician and anthropologist who has worked in Haiti's impoverished Central Plateau for 25 years, agrees with Father Poulard. The majority of his inspiration comes from listening to very, very poor parishioners, people living in slums, people who are child servants, women who have many children but don't have any stable employment. And, and that was the focus of his own ministry as a priest. Farmer's Clinic has grown into an impressive medical and educational complex and serves as a model for bringing health care to the world's poorest communities. Farmer himself has been outspoken in his support for Haiti's embattled former president. When you look back at people who adopt ideas that are uh, unnerving to the powerful, the idea, for example, that the Haitian poor just want poverty with dignity and base, a few basic rights, you know, clean water to go to school, etc., those are profoundly disturbing ideas in some circles. And they're profoundly popular ideas among the poor themselves. Already well known as a tireless advocate for the poor, in the late 1980s, Aristide began drawing attention for his fervent criticism of the military and foreign domination of the country. Si vraiment ils reconnaissent avoir volé, si vraiment ils reconnaissent avoir volé à travers leurs compatriotes tout au long du processus de colonisation, si vraiment ils veulent dire à la face du monde entier qu'ils sont développés, qu'ils commencent à ne pas avoir pitié d'Haïti, nous n'avons pas besoin de pitié, nous. Qu'ils commencent à ne pas avoir pitié de nous, mais à reconnaître le droit que nous avons, droit de récupérer un peu de ce qu'ils ont volé. Alors, alors, ils pourront se dire des personnes humaines qui transcendent le matériel pour déboucher sur une dimension spirituelle où la personne humaine se développe continuellement et n'ose pas appeler quelqu'un qui l'a exploité un sous-développé quand lui-même il est le premier sous-développé. Aristide's passionate speeches chastising the world's wealthier powers not only had an impact in Haiti, but within the international community as well. John Shattuck, who served throughout the globe as the Assistant Secretary of State for Human Rights in the Clinton administration, recalls Aristide's significance following the Duvalier dictatorships. Aristide represented a people's reform movement and genuinely, I think, was trying for the first time ever in Haitian history, at least in modern history, to uh, be the voice of the voiceless, the voice of the people who had previously had no source of support and who were constantly the victims of a corrupt elite and a military regime. Aristide and others like him are, are, are the opposite, are the result of the Duvalier years. The Duvaliers were there for 30 years almost and created a society that, that's completely immoral. For over 30 years, Francois Duvalier and later his son Jean-Claude ruled Haiti as dictators, dominating the population with brutality. Using a ruthless militia of loyalists known as the Tonton Makout, the Duvaliers expropriated millions of dollars from the Haitian treasury and committed countless human rights abuses. 
When a popular uprising finally forced Jean-Claude from power in 1986, he fled to France, leaving in his wake a nation ravaged by chaos and violence. Ray LaForest, now a human rights activist, remembers growing up under the Duvalier regime. To Duvalier represented a complete lack of respect for life, abuse, raping of women and children and families, a degradation of the society, just naked aggression, a neo-fascist system. Jean-Claude Duvalier's departure left both a political and security vacuum in Haiti. And for the next three years, former Tonton Makout and army loyalists battled over control of the country, killing countless civilians. In 1990, the international community finally decided it had seen enough unrest, and a UN mission was dispatched to Haiti to oversee a presidential election. Father Aristide, refusing to be intimidated by multiple assassination attempts and the burning of his church and orphanage, decided to run for the presidency. Aristide called his party Lavalas, or the People's Flood and his grassroots campaign and fiery populist rhetoric instantly connected with the people tired of oppression and suffering. President Aristide came out of City Soleil. He was a priest who spoke Creole and talked with the people and communicated. Prior to that time, people in power spoke French. And up comes this priest talking to poor people. And yes, he created for them hope. He communicated with them and he led the way uh, to change. Today, President Aristide lives in exile in South Africa. When we spoke with him there, he described the challenge of trying to work with a society dangerously divided into wealthy elites and millions of poor. We said we should not create a kind of war where rich fighting poor and poor fighting against rich, but a kind of place where rich and poor can work together. He's simply saying to the property classes, you have to give a little more to the poor. We want to move from abject misery to dignified poverty. That was his, that was his program. But those in Haiti's elite class who opposed Aristide's social reforms accuse him of being divisive. En prenant la lutte, so de lutte des classes, là il a tout cassé, et je crois. Mais... Il fallait évidemment prôner le partage parce que il faut le reconnaître en Haïti notre élite n'a pas travaillé suffisamment à la promotion des masses. But Danny Glover, a political activist, actor and close friend of Aristide who's been following events in Haiti for over 30 years, disagrees. To to raise the minimum wage just slightly which was what Aristide attempted to do to bring uh, medical services to that island, uh, which has not only inadequate medical services, but is one of the leading countries in the region in terms of HIV AIDS. To bring those things to that island were very minimal things that you do for people who you consider to be human beings. Not all of Aristide's opposition came from within Haiti. 600 miles to the north, the U.S. government had its own ideas for the upcoming election. Noam Chomsky, a professor at MIT who has written extensively about Haiti, remembers the American reaction to Aristide's candidacy. Finally, in 1990, Haiti had its first democratic election. The U.S. was appalled by the outcome. Uh, the victor was a populist priest, Aristide whose support had come from a lively civil society that had developed in the slums and the hills that nobody was paying any attention to, just poor people. And the idea that they would elect their own president was outrageous. Uh, the U.S. at once moved to try to undermine the 
democratic government withdrew aid, transferred aid to opposition element. Before Aristide had even entered the race, the U.S. government had put millions of dollars behind the campaign of a former World Bank official, Marc Bazin. Despite this support, on December 16, 1990, Jean-Bertrand Aristide became the first democratically elected president of Haiti with a staggering 67% of the vote. It was a boldly voiced mandate. But while the Haitian people rejoiced, Aristide's opponents, both in Haiti and within the U.S. government, began to explore more palatable options. When the United States picked Mark Bazin to be the candidate, he comes a little scraggly guy who's talking about union rights, who's talking about, you know, reivindication of the Haitian people. And because he was able to bring them together so well, I mean, within three months of being a candidate, I said, won the election with a huge plurality. The U.S. was extremely terrified of the potential for Aristide. Aristide's talk of union rights and higher minimum wages in Haiti put at stake for the U.S. business community 20,000 assembly line jobs, contracted at less than 50 cents a day by corporations like Disney and Walmart, sweatshop labor formerly protected by the island's heavily armed elites and political instability. The forces that were at work were long-standing um, supporters of the old regime in Haiti, particularly the old military regime, but also the, some of the Haitian elites. There were support for those elites in the, in the old regime in the U.S. Congress. Once we have election, where we will not have weapons, bloodshed, but on an equal basis, human beings freely choosing people they want to lead them, then we would feed our democratic process. Then we would break with the tradition of moving from one coup d'etat to another coup d'etat, but moving from one democratic election to another one. That was the goal. Aristide represented a threat to them because Aristide was the voice of the 85% of the country who had never been heard. If that can happen in Haiti, then it could happen in Colombia, and it's obviously happened in Venezuela, it can happen in Peru, and, and so on down the line. And they do not want those kind of popular democracies because they believe that they will confront U.S. economic interests. In 1990, Haiti had the first free, fair, democratic elections when I became president. Seven months later, a coup happened. At that time, Bush father was the president of the United States. The 1991 coup was carried out by the Haitian army, whose leadership was trained by the CIA and at the Fort Benning Infantry School in the United States. Although Aristide was restored to office by President Clinton in 1994, he had only a year left in his term. When René Preval won the elections that followed, Aristide became the first Haitian president ever to peacefully hand over power to another elected leader. After regaining the presidency in the 2000 elections, Aristide was forced out of office for the second time in early 2004. Today, he sees a clear connection between the two coups. In 2004, a kidnapping happened. They kidnapped me, which is also a coup. And Bush's son is the president. Somehow, something can be linked to find the reason that happened twice. So I think they wanted to continue what they started in 1991 through the first coup. Hold on for a second, hold on for a second, please. President Aristide uh, resigned. 
Uh, he has left his country. Uh, the Constitution of Haiti is working. There is an interim president, uh, as per the Constitution, uh, in place. Uh, I have uh, ordered the deployment of Marines as the leading element of an interim international force to help bring uh, order and stability to Haiti. I have done so uh, in working with the international community. Uh, this government believes it is essential that Haiti uh, have a hopeful future. Uh, this is the beginning of a new chapter in the country's history. I would urge the people of Haiti to reject violence, uh, to give this uh, break from the past, a chance to work, and the United States is prepared to help. Thank you. That includes the humanitarian aid as well, Mr. President. Again, the world watched as Haiti descended into violence and chaos. But this time, the circumstances surrounding Aristide's departure are far less certain. Of Haiti's capital erupted. Around every corner, within sight of the presidential palace, rival gangs riot. Where from the Haiti? Uh, Chidi Soleil and Bel Air right now are, are being strafed by automatic gunfire by right former military riding around in pickup trucks who apparently um, um, are not considered uh, to be bound by the 6 p.m. curfew that the United States has put in place in Haiti tonight. One area of uncertainty is the morning of February 29th, when Aristide left Haiti. It is known that he departed on a U.S. military jet and that he was kept unaware of his eventual destination. After more than 20 hours in the air, he was deposited in the Central African Republic, a nation the United States has no diplomatic ties with. Ira Kurzban, who served as general counsel to Aristide's administration, elaborates. When he wouldn't turn over the uh, resignation letter, uh, they threatened to uh, uh, let the plane fly out and leave him there uh, at the airport stranded without any security at all. This was the ultimate gun to uh, someone's head. They used intimidation, coercion, and then after they got him on the plane, basically kidnapped them and refused to tell them where they were going, refused to allow them to even look out the windows. U.S. officials in both Washington and Haiti were quick to respond. The idea that someone was abducted is just totally inconsistent with everything I heard or saw or uh, am aware of. He was not kidnapped. We did not force him onto the airplane. He went onto the airplane willingly, uh, and that's the truth. We didn't request his departure. You went yesterday to the palace at night? No, I did not. Uh, we did, the you you did the U.S. push so President Aristide out of power? President Aristide. Mm -hmm made a decision for the good of Haiti, and I think... Roger Noriega, the current Assistant Secretary of State for the Western Hemisphere, echoed his colleagues' denials. We did conclude, uh, because of his failure to take advantage of opportunities over the years, uh, that he probably wasn't going to be able to govern uh, the country. But uh, uh, in the final analysis, decision for him to leave was a decision that he made. And although the U.S. State Department presented to the world what effectively amounts to a letter of resignation, even some members of Congress are skeptical. In March of 2004, congressional hearings were held in Washington to investigate the ongoing crisis in Haiti and the role played by the U.S. government in Aristide's removal. Among those testifying were Timothy Carney, a former U.S. ambassador to Haiti, and Orlando Marville, a senator from Barbados who has monitored Haitian elections for the Organization of American States, the OAS. Both now serve on the board of the Haiti Democracy Project, the most powerful anti-Aristide lobby in Washington. Many for calling these hearings. Let me take advantage of the ambassadors that are here and, and uh, ask them, uh, what does coup d'etat mean as relates to uh, 
American understanding of the international understanding of that French term, coup d'etat. Ambassador Connie, I'm going to ask Ambassador Marvel as well, but since both of you are professional diplomats, what does it mean to you? Uh, a, a blow against the state, if you will, the forcible uh, seizure of power. Uh, and there are any number of ways to perpetrate one. There was a book, in fact, done in the mid-60s by uh, Edward Lutwak. That's good for me, though. Entitled Coup d'etat. Uh, I concur with that. It's a forcible takeover of power, but uh, that's an old definition. And uh, I think one is moving towards the definition of a takeover by force, a subtle takeover, Very a good. soft coup, okay. a hard coup, and so on. Let's take an academic thing. From what we know, from what Secretary Noriega said, what does not make this a coup d'etat as ambassadors understand it? Rebels force, fear, flee. When we interviewed both diplomats, they again stopped short of calling Aristide's departure a coup. But they underscored the U.S. decision to facilitate his removal. As you appreciate, Aristide had an American guard, not Haitian. And he asked the guards if they were prepared to stand up and fight to the end. And they said, no. As I gather, he went to the US Embassy and asked if they would do something about it. And they said, no. I think if you, if you look at Haiti and Aristide and the United States, you are inescapably led to the logic that the international community, those who care about Haiti, looked at Aristide and found him inadequate. Yet some of those who Carney describes as dissatisfied with Aristide's presidency have been more than just bystanders to Haiti's political wars. The Washington-based Haiti Democracy Project, which Carney now chairs, is largely funded by the Boulos family, a Haitian conglomerate that owns several media outlets constantly used to lambaste President Aristide. The Group of 184, another anti-Aristide organization, is also headed by an American, Andy Aped, the president of Alpha Industries, one of the oldest and largest assembly factories in Haiti. The leader of the opposition, financially supported by the United States, is an American citizen, Andy Aped, who owns sweatshops in Haiti, and he opposed the rise of the minimum wage when President Aristide said the minimum wage has to be raised from 38 cents a day to a dollar a day. But are these interests significant enough to topple the government? Well, they were significant enough to have a coup in 1991 when President Aristide was first there, and, and obviously the U.S. military helped. So the answer is yes, I think they are significant enough in the United States government's view. The United States does not want popular democracy in the Western Hemisphere. Popular democracy meaning people who are democratically elected who want to represent the vast majority of people within their country. That's the fight with Chavez. That was the fight with Allende. That was the fight with Michael Manley in Jamaica. And that's the fight with Aristide. Except Haiti is a much poorer country, much easier to topple, much easier to uh, have uh, a coup there. This is not a about uh, anything but the ideology of the far right wing that now really controls the United States government that does not support popular democracy. They don't believe in it. They believe in working with the elites in these countries and using the military or using intelligence sources in these countries to keep control. In other words, we simply do not accept challenges to our authority and prestige. Uh, if they occur, we're entitled to use violence or terror or uh, strangulation and so on. In this region, the, and in fact, by now, you know, in the world, the U.S. is to reign supreme. Actually, in Haiti, what we have is a real genocide. The huge majority of the people as Lavalas, they are in hiding. So, unfortunately, convicted people, well-financed, once by foreign hands and now well protected by those same hands, they continue to kill people, arrest others, put them in jail. So it's real genocide where the U.S. bear the responsibility.
Yet not all in Haiti were affected by the violence and chaos of the 2004 coup. In Pechenville, where many of the elites who opposed Aristide's presidency live behind locked gates and armed guards, we asked if such a violent overthrow could have been avoided. A sociologist and writer well known in both Haiti and abroad, Lenik Urban opposed Aristide's presidency. La transition qu'on voulait par rapport à Aristide, c'était pas d'abord le départ d'Aristide comme tel. C'était une transition qui permettait de maîtriser la police qui était truffée de bandits introduits par Aristide, habillés même en policiers par Aristide, et, euh, une, et des moyens pour juguler euh, les, les, les gangs euh, que Aristide appelait des bases, euh, les bases de son parti. C'était ça le problème principal. Donc on en voulait Aristide pour ça. Et donc, si on arrivait à contrôler cela, Aristide aurait pu rester au pouvoir. Mais Aristide n'a même pas compris cela. Claude Moïse, an historian and the editor of the conservative Haitian paper Le Matin, also owned by the Boulos family, suggests Aristide's departure was necessary. But the community international wanted a solution to negotiate. So the solution to negotiate, it had to be with the two parties. Otherwise, dit Aristide on one side and the opposition on the other. So the community international wanted to go to the end. But at the moment where she realized that there was nothing to do and that the situation risked to basculer in an anarchy total, at that moment, they were intervened and they said, Aristide, there was nothing to do, you have to go. L'événement qui a fait perdre à Aristide tout son crédit, c'est d'abord les élections de l'an 2000. On sentait que les Haïtiens croyaient qu'ils allaient vers un certain progrès de la démocratie. Or, on a vu qu'Aristide a tenté de manipuler et il a réussi. Là, on a trouvé ça extrêmement suspect. C'est à partir de là on voyait que Aristide s'accrochait à un pouvoir qu'il voulait absolu. Toute la crise va se développer autour des élections jusqu'à chute d'Aristide. The controversy that arose during the parliamentary elections in May of 2000 in Haiti posed a new kind of challenge for Aristide. First, his opponents accused the Lavalas party of stealing eight Senate seats. In the months that followed, leading up to the presidential elections in November of that same year, the controversy gained momentum, and the international community leapt at the chance to condemn Aristide's party. Aristide again won the presidency with an overwhelming majority, this time by 91%. And although the results of his election were never seriously questioned, the controversy surrounding the parliamentary elections was used by the opposition and the media to stain his presidency. They lied by creating the confusion between two different elections. One was in March, the other one was in November. The presidential election was in November. Two different elections. But they lied by creating the confusion as if it were just one single election. When we spoke with Ira Kurzban in Miami, he blamed the controversy on the Bush administration. They saw after the May 2000 election that the Famille Lavalas party was going to be in power for the next 20 or 30 years. This was not only about Aristide, and was not, I would even say, principally about Aristide. It was really about the destruction of the Lavalas party, because the Lavalas party is what represented the majority interest. At the congressional hearings in 2004, Secretary Noriega again tried to use the 2000 parliamentary elections to question the legitimacy of Aristide's second term. And the fraudulent parliamentary elections once again in May 2000. This series of farcical electoral exercises... I was there, Mr. Noriega. Let's really understand what the fraudulent elections are all about so that the American people understand them. The elections themselves were relatively well 
well done, given the situation in Haiti at the time. It was about whether the certain runoff for seven Senate seats would occur. Is that a fair statement, Mr. Noriega? Yes, it is an accurate statement. Thank you. However, when we spoke with Orlando Marville in Barbados, who led the OAS team responsible for monitoring those elections, he argued that the controversy over the eight Senate seats cannot be so easily dismissed. Everybody had put everything into this electoral process, believing it would be clean. In the senatorial vote, Femi Lavalas was winning, but they were not winning everything. When we realized that the counting was strange, we sat down, went through it again, and said, there's been some fishing here. There's some, something strange going on. According to the Haitian Constitution, to be elected as a senator, one must receive an absolute majority of votes, at least 51%. If no candidate obtains a majority, the law requires a runoff. The OAS election observers, however, concluded that the Electoral Council had declared eight Lavala senators victorious who had not achieved an absolute majority. While all eight had been the leading candidates, a runoff was required for their elections to be valid. I drafted a letter to the president, René Poival, and to the president of the Electoral Council. And the president called me in the following day and I said, look, this is a simple matter. He's winning, all he has to do is to say, have the second elections and we're home. Just we for these senators? Yes. Yet it is not entirely clear how Aristide himself, who held no official position at the time, can be blamed for the council's refusal to hold a runoff election. President Aristide, as soon as he was elected, um, had seven of those eight senators resign their seats, and President Aristide sent a letter to the OAS saying that they would redo that election. In the letter, Aristide first stated, I am now in a position to inform you that the seven contested senators have resigned. The letter also asked the council to set the date for elections of the contested seats in a timely manner. Andy Aped's group of 184 joined with the Democratic Convergence, a political conglomerate partly funded by the U.S. government, to form the opposition voice that instigated much of the electoral crisis. Notre position au niveau de la plateforme démocratique est claire. Il faut le départ de Jean Bertrand Aristide comme premier élément de solution de cette crise. So they just continued to raise the bar, to continue to make it clear that, that they were um, not going to accept any surrender. They were taking no prisoners. They wanted Aristide out. The opposition, of course, knew that it couldn't win in a general election. Uh, uh, you could have observers from, uh, from all over the world and they couldn't win. You could have every vote counted and recounted and counted and recounted again and they couldn't win. So the only way in which they could actually assert themselves and take power was to create the kind of crisis and conflict that, that, uh, uh, that ensued. Those eight contested seats were ultimately used as the excuse for a full-scale embargo on Haiti, uh, which was really designed uh, not to do anything about those eight seats, but really designed to topple the Lavalas government. With a population of nearly eight million, a jobless rate hovering near 70 percent, a well-armed elite unwilling to pay taxes, and a federal budget of only $300 million, Haiti was a nation most desperately in need of foreign aid. Yet throughout the 1990s and into this millennium, the U.S. government blocked the international financial institutions from helping the first democratically elected government in Haiti's history.
With few financial resources to maintain control of an impoverished nation, President Aristide frequently spoke out against the embargo. And the embargo was the beginning, really, of the end of democratic rule in Haiti because it was designed by the United States, along with support from Canada and France, to destabilize the government. What you saw as the Bush administration came in was a, a tightening noose around Haiti, which really, uh, that is to say, a almost total embargo and, and virtually no, uh, not only any assistance going in, but really a, a, a fairly sharp embargo that prevented uh, the kind of support coming in that would have assisted Haiti uh, to get back on its feet. Do you think that the U.S. embargo might be responsible for the collapse of Aristide's regime? Well, it's ridiculous. Uh, what's called an embargo, by the way, uh, began in the year 2000. Uh, and that was a decision on the part of the Clinton administration to link the dispersal of international financial assistance to Haiti on the reaching of a political settlement that would be a viable democratic uh, solution to Haiti's problems. However, in April of 2001, the U.S. representative to the IDB wrote a letter to the bank's president. The letter acknowledges that the bank approved six loans to Haiti, but concludes, we do not believe that these loans should be treated in a routine manner and strongly urge you to not authorize disbursement. According to Brian Con Cannon, a human rights lawyer who has worked in Haiti for nearly 20 years, the letter violated two rules of the IDB charter. First, it was a violation of the bank's internal rules because once a loan was all set and ratified, there was no process for stopping it uh, in, in mid-flight. The second thing is the IDB charter holds that it should not be used for political purposes. And this was clearly a, a political use. And so they basically just came in and bullied the, the IDB to, to stop those loans. But despite the IDB's unprecedented reversal, the Haitian government was asked to service the debt on the $500 million they never received. They prevent Haiti to get that money, and they oblige us to pay $5 million as interest for the money, which they still kept at that time. Although the Bush administration continually argues that the United States has given more than $850 million in aid to Haiti over the last decade, Maxine Waters and Jeffrey Sachs, one of the world's leading macroeconomists, point out that none of that money went to the Aristide government. People know that the figure that the chairman and others referred to today of $850 million did not go to uh, the Aristide government. Uh, how many people understand that there's a difference between bilateral aid that goes directly to the government and the funding of non-government organizations. How many people understand that? Understood. Yeah. Congresswoman? Yes, please respond quickly. Uh, yes, uh, very, very, very quickly. I spoke with President Aristide in early 2001. He laid out a very sensible, responsible economic vision that and wanted to work with the Inter-American Development Bank, the International Monetary Fund, and the World Bank. And thus, I was particularly shocked to come back to Washington to find a U.S.-imposed freeze on all of those institutions. How many people know that if you don't have that kind of aid, you have no money for the infrastructure, you have no money to clean up the water, you have no money for the police, you have no money for the fire, and 
while Mr. Aristide has been blamed for not doing anything about poverty, do you understand how he was strangled uh, by the lack of aid, bilateral or otherwise? How let many me, people understand that? Let me speak as a macroeconomist to say that it's even worse than that because they drained him of foreign exchange reserves as he continued to service the debts to the international institutions. The exchange rate collapsed. The inflation rose and the economy collapsed, and that was the deliberate result of the strangulation of aid. Well, I hope we can get rid of some of the lies and misconceptions gentle, about all of this money that has gone to the government when, in fact, it has not. The and I don't want to hear expired. that said anymore. So I just wanted to get that on the, the record. Gentlelady's time has expired. Thank you uh, so very much. By withdrawing all financial aid not only from the United States, France, Canada, the European Union, but also the United States using its considerable power in the Inter-American Development Bank, the World Bank, and the IMF, using all of those to create a full-scale economic embargo. So not one penny of money went to the Haitian government between the year 2000 and February 29, 2004. Without shutting off all assistance to the Western Hemisphere's poorest country, it would have not been possible to, you know, to have s uh, such a small number of even heavily armed people, um, you know, sweep through Haiti. The United States wanted to prevent Haiti to go through a democratic process. They gave weapons to thugs from Santo Domingo to Haiti. They went to kill people. Every year, they spent about 55 million U.S. dollars. And last year, it went up to 70 million U.S. dollars financing thugs, convicted people, political parties. Even James Dobbins, who worked in Haiti on behalf of both the Clinton and Bush administrations, and is now a consultant for the Rand Corporation in Washington, acknowledges the mistake. I think that the decision to cut off all assistance to Haiti in 2000, a decision which wasn't just American, by the way, but which Europe uh, um, uh, agreed to, um, uh, is directly responsible for the disintegration of Haitian institutions uh, and the weakness which would allow 200 armed criminals to overthrow the government. And as James Dobbin suggests, it is not only the U.S. government that has been blamed for Haiti's descent into chaos. For Napoleon's France, Haiti was the Republic's most valuable colony in the New World, capable of generating immense wealth on the backs of the island's enslaved population of Africans. By the summer of 1800, however, a freed slave named Toussaint Louverture had taken advantage of the constant skirmishes between the Spanish and French to form a formidable army of his own. In January of 1801, Toussaint expelled the European powers from Haiti, freed the slaves, created a constitution, and became governor of the island. Napoleon, however, would not be denied, and behind an invasion the following year, forced Toussaint to lay down his arms and retire. A few weeks later, Haiti's first liberator was accused of plotting an uprising kidnapped and sent to France, where he died in a prison in April of 1803. The French refused to formally recognize Haiti as an independent nation, and the island's inhabitants lived in constant fear of their former colonizer. In 1825, the French sent 14 warships into the harbor of Port-au-Prince, and under the threat of reoccupation and restitution of slavery, coerced Haitian President Jean-Pierre Boyer to pay France 90 million gold francs in exchange for diplomatic recognition. The debt has been a stranglehold on the Haitian economy ever since. In an attempt to remove this burden, on the bicentennial of Toussaint's death in April of 2003, in a bold and desperate speech, Aristide called upon France to return the money, which his government calculated to equal over $21 billion. Il nous faut premièrement restitution, deuxièmement réparation. Parce qu'en 1825, sous le gouvernement de Boyer, nous avons dû payer 90 millions de francs or à la France. Aujourd'hui, nous réclamons au moins la valeur capitalisée pour l'année 2003, soit 21 milliards 
685 millions 135 571.48 dollars US. C'est vrai que en, au cours du 19e siècle, la France a négocié très dur les conditions de la reconnaissance diplomatique d'Haïti et a imposé à ce gouvernement, ce qu'on ne pourrait évidemment absolument plus faire aujourd'hui, de payer une dette pour les spoliations des colons français. Enfin, ce sont des choses qui seraient inconcevables aujourd'hui et qui ont lourdement pesé sur l'économie d'Haïti pendant tout le 19e siècle. Mais ça appartient à l'histoire, on ne peut pas revenir sur des conditions historiques qui ne seraient plus du tout les mêmes aujourd'hui, pas plus qu'on ne pourra demander aux Espagnols de payer, pour, de faire des réparations pour les crimes commis par les conquistadors. Tout ça n'a pas de sens, l'histoire tourne. Pour le président Aristide, however, historical injustices ne peuvent pas être so easily forgotten. Je ask respectfully to friends on behalf of the Haitian government and the Haitian people to be paid because this money belongs to the people of Haiti. To press the issue with France, the Aristide government ran commercials like this one on Haitian national television, connecting an historical injustice with Haiti's current economic crisis. Aujourd'hui, la France est là pour coopérer, elle va coopérer avec Haïti, elle souhaite le faire, développer cette coopération, mais pas euh, à la suite d'un calcul de boutiquier, inspiré d'ailleurs par des avocats américains, rembourser un, un argent qu'elle ne considère pas devoir. There's no doubt that the issue of reparations irked the French a good deal, no matter what they said. And I personally worked on the reparations case. I was the lawyer who was going to bring the action on behalf of the Haitian government on reparations. And I can tell you the Haitian government had a very strong case that would have embarrassed the French government. They knew it despite their denials and saying, oh, this is nonsense and so forth. They were so concerned about it that they stole legal documents. Their consul in Haiti somehow got internal legal documents regarding uh, the claims that were going to be made against the French government. So as much as they were saying publicly that this was something that was not that important, they were busy trying to find out everything they could about the action that was going to be brought against them. The difference between the Haitian case for restitution is that it is a strong legal case as well. Haiti was the subject of multiple trade and diplomatic embargoes from 1804 on. Haiti's claims, even a hundred years ago, you know, they, they were outlined in legal documents and treaties, and the threat of force was used to, and, and restoration of slavery, was used to push Haiti into signing these uh, unfavorable agreements with France. Bricard is familiar with Farmer's criticism. Ah oui, Paul Farmer a été un soutien inconditionnel d'Aristide sur ce dossier de la réparation. C'est un peu dommage parce que Paul Farmer est une grande figure, quelqu'un qui a fait un travail admirable en Haïti, mais il s'est lancé dans cette histoire avec une naïveté qui nous a tous surpris et il a euh, suivi les, les idées d'Aristide à un point absolument incroyable, car en fait ces idées ne tenaient pas debout. For Rico Dupuis, a Haitian journalist for Radio Soleil, Aristide's request was a mistake. Look, you don't fight two major powers at the same time. They're going to come at you with, with full strength, full force. That may have been the mistake of Aristide. Not that Aristide's demand is a, it, illegitimate. Haiti has a valid case for restitution. When I met with President Chirac twice, I openly and respectfully said, We would wish that we could celebrate together those 200 years of freedom as universal value. And he said yes. But as we know in diplomacy, sometimes you say yes to do the opposite. C'est une situation particulière. Aucun pays en Amérique, aucun pays en Amérique latine, aucun pays dans les Caraïbes n'a eu à subir cette extorsion de fonds 
qui a subi Haïti, qui a hypothéqué gravement et sévèrement son développement économique et social. Do you think it was unwise for Aristide to press France for reparations? Evidently, yeah. Evidently, it was very unwise because, you know, let's look at it this way. Was Haiti too poor to ask for help? I mean, that's pitiful. You're basically saying that if you don't have the, the resources to back you up, uh, you know, legally, militarily, economically, don't bother pressing for justice. He knew that the government had no money. And I think this was one of the ways in which I think Haiti would have gotten money, quite frankly, from the French government had the case been pursued. So I think he had no other alternative but to pursue other avenues of, of obtaining funds for Haiti. With a depleted national treasury and no access to foreign aid, a disbanded army and a police force crippled by the U.S. embargo, an already tenuous security situation in Haiti rapidly deteriorated. In the fall of 2003, a group of so-called rebels supported by those in opposition to Aristide's presidency and armed with American-made M-16s seized control of the northern Haitian city of Gonaïve and began to move on the capital, Port-au-Prince. The thugs who had come out of exile, who had taken over Ghana, even then Cape Haitian, Mr. Guy Philippe, Mr. Louis Jodel Chamblain, Mr. Jean Tantou, uh, we didn't feel that they just came in out of the blue. We felt that they were organized, that they came in uh, cooperating with the opposition. We felt that the United States, Canada, and France knew about it, and they literally just used the uh, killers to help pull off the coup d'etat. Louis Jodel Chamblain has been convicted of murder twice. And Guy Philippe, the face of the coup with ties to the U.S. Defense Department, has been implicated in numerous human rights abuses. And according to Ira Kurzban, they armed their insurgency with weapons from the U.S. government. Uh, we have proof, for example, that those rebels were armed with M-16s, uh, which the United States had given to the Dominican uh, military a year before in a special operation. We know that the people who were in charge of the so-called rebels, about 80 or 100 of them, first of all, were fully trained and integrated into the Dominican army, something that the Dominican army would never do without getting the green light from uh, the Defense Department in the United States. In order to have a coup, you have to have planning and resources, finances, especially when there's no military in the country anymore, when the military has been uh, demobilized. Yet, while Aristide's decision to disband the army meant the military could no longer move against the government as it had in 1991, John Shattuck argues it left a dangerous security void. One thing that Aristide did, which was principled, idealistic in some ways, but I think in the end a big mistake, was to completely abolish the army. Um, and he abolished the army so that there was no Haitian capacity for keeping law and order and security. Both the Haitian people and the international community, however, welcomed Aristide's decision. When I came to office, this army involved in leading coup after coup led a coup instead of protecting democracy and the rights of the people. When I went back in 1994, this army, after killing more than 5,000 people, the people were asking me to disband the army. I obey. In any democracy within the framework of law of your constitution, you take care of the will of the people. But the disbanding of the Haitian army, despite being carried out with the help of the United States and the UN, was incomplete and created new security problems. In addition, the U.S. government imposed a police materials embargo on the Aristide government, crippling even further its capacity to provide security. Secretary Noriega, however, continues to blame Haiti's lack of security on Aristide. The uh, insecurity, uh, because there was no uh, rule of law in the country, was, was the way Aristide wanted it. Uh, he wanted to have these sort of uh, uh, criminal gangs uh, that he unleashed on his opponents. Aristide, however, in some of his most rousing speeches as president, frequently spoke out against crime. We put femmes on us, we put girls on us, to be able to combat the misery, to be able to tolerate the security in the country.
Moi, je veux, moi, je décide pour tout Haïtien vivre en paix. Moi, on a une place publique, il faut sentir à l'aise. Il faut pas qu'il sauter. Il faut que les gens ne pas qu'ils osent menacer. Le pays a assez pour nous lier. Le pays a assez pour nous tous lier. Vous ne pouvez pas déjà la misère. Et puis, vous avez pour les criminels comprendre la force vivre avec les autres. Nous ne pouvons pas tolérer ça. Nous ne pouvons pas tolérer ça. For James Dobbins, the cycle of violence in Haiti that began long before Aristide's presidency is not necessarily an inherent problem, but rather one promoted by a lack of assistance from the international community. I mean, you know, they say that, that history repeats itself first as tragedy and then as farce. In Haiti's case, it's always tragedy. Uh, Aristide is the 35th Haitian president to be driven from office. Um, this is the fourth American intervention in 90 years. Aristide himself has been driven from office twice. Um, everything seems to come around and repeat itself in endless cycles. Um, uh, how do we break this cycle? It's not going to happen in a year or two. Uh, it's only going to happen through an extended application of uh, international engagement. So you don't, you don't have an alternative in Haiti. It's, it's too weak to uh, isolate and cut off assistance unless you're prepared to follow that up with a military intervention. Rather than blaming the international community, however, Secretary Noriega believes the political violence in Haiti is mostly the result of Aristide's leadership. President Aristide didn't just make mistakes. Uh, I think he willfully uh, misgoverned. He undermined the rule of law at every turn. He denied uh, political opponents an opportunity to contrib contribute and participate peacefully in, in the government of the country. Uh, so it's, it's a failure in, in, uh, of, of the person, but it's a willful decision on his part. Uh, and eventually he paid the price for that because he uh, lost uh, his ability to control these, uh, the whirlwind of violence that he had unleashed on the country for a decade. Do you have evidence that supports these allegations against President Aristide? We know his record. I indicated to you that uh, uh, at least a half a dozen prominent killings of political opponents took place, uh, hit squads operating out of the National Palace from using weapons, and we have the ballistic information that proves this, that were out of the inventory of the palace security unit, which was directly uh, accountable to him. His key security aides were, are implicated uh, in these uh, political murders. Uh, so we think that that's uh, the way the, the, the men operated. Uh, and in recent, uh, in recent weeks, we see his supporters uh, threatening to behead people. And indeed, people are beheaded. Do, are we witnesses to this? No. Uh, but I think we can draw certain conclusions uh, about who is wielding uh, this kind of political violence. But for Brian Con Cannon, who has investigated human rights abuses in Haiti since the early 1990s, these accusations are baseless. 
Now, I, I would say that Jean-Claude Duvalier stole hundreds of millions of dollars. I would say that the de facto regime gave guns to civilians to commit human rights violations because I have the documents to prove it. Uh, the, those accusations keep getting made against Aristide, and again, there's no proof. And it, it's a source of continual frustration that those types of accusations keep getting out there and, and people credit them without asking for the normal standards of proof that, that you would ask for in any kind of a case. It's time for those people who think they have something concrete uh, that they can share about Mr. Aristide that should have led to the ouster of a democratically elected president to put it on the line. When you look at the situation today, even with UN troops on the ground, and you look at the situation before February 29th, Okay, it's certainly in 2001 and 2002, and even during most of 2003, Aristide performed a miracle. With somebody who had no money, 3,000 police, he was able to keep, the, in effect, the lid on everything. Haitian people continue on the ground to say yes to our president and we want him to be back, it's because they believe in democratic values. They voted for a president, the mandate was for five years, a good number unfortunately were killed for that, for defending an elected president, an elected government, and others today are killed just because they continue to ask for the respect of the vote, showing the commitment to live in a peaceful and democratic society. While their supporters march for the return of the president they elected four years ago, the Lavalas leadership remains in Haitian prisons, or in exile. One of those leaders is Mario Dupuy. When interviewed in Miami, he argued that political repression has not confused the Lavalas party structure. Fomi Lavalas n'a pas de problème de leadership. Si vous allez n'importe où en Haïti, dans la section communale la plus reculée, vous demandez à un Haïtien qui est le chef de Fomi Lavalas, il vous répondra Jean-Bertrand Aristide. Donc, l'organisation n'a pas de problème de leadership. Donc, c'est un leadership reconnu et incontesté au sein de l'organisation. Yet for Gerard Latortou, Haiti's interim prime minister. The Lavalas party structure must change. Oui, pour vous dire la vérité, pour moi le président Aristide c'est déjà le passé. Je ne voudrais pas même revenir et surtout ça, mais n'empêche qu'il exerce un pouvoir et sur certains de ses partisans. Peut-être qu'il continuera à l'exercer aussi longtemps que peut-être Hitler ne cesse d'exercer une influence sur l'extrême droite du monde entier. Nous invitons tous les partis politiques, y compris le parti de la de M. Aristide, à joindre le processus électoral parce que, comme on le sait bien, dans une démocratie, le pouvoir ne peut s'acquérir que par les urnes, par le vote et non pas par, la, par les armes. Comment voulez-vous, moralement, Politiquement, nous puissions demander à la population d'aller participer dans un processus électoral sans garantie et à Formula Blas de participer dans des élections quand ses dirigeants, ses cadres sont en exil. La preuve, son représentant national est en exil, le président de la République. Ses dirigeants connus et influents sont en prison, ils vont les tuer, les compagnies sont en etc. Yet the accusation that human rights abuses and political repression have become rampant in Haiti since the coup 
is not coming only from Lavalas members. Alarmed by the horrific reports he was hearing from his contacts in Haiti, Thomas Griffin, a decorated U.S. attorney who was the first to document the human rights abuses in Haiti under the interim government, returned last November with a team from the University of Miami to conduct a more thorough investigation. I came back with probably 200, over 200 photographs and about 300 pages of notes and some tape recordings. I saw things that people are never supposed to see, uh, that are just inhuman. I mean, my, my report does show plenty of pictures of bodies that you just see. I mean, their daily life is to walk by a body that's being eaten by a dog because it was killed, you know, the night before. You know, or the police had charged through and shot a lot of people the day before. His report concludes that after 10 months under an interim government backed by the U.S. and France, summary executions carried out by the Haitian National Police are routine. Haiti's brutal and disbanded army has returned to occupy much of the countryside, and former members of Aristide's administration and Lavalas leaders fill Haiti's prisons with no real charges brought against them. The most articulate voices and the most spirited voices for democracy in Haiti are being allowed to die from starvation and from violence. It's a, it's a, it's a setback that's, that's multiple decades backwards. Everything's broken, um, and everybody knows it. In February of 2005, we encountered what the UN called a cleaning operation in the Port-au-Prince slum Bel Air. Amidst this heavily armed presence, Few dared to appear on camera or speak to us about Aristide or Lavalas. Aristide Aïsid lui-même, il fait à un pile pour. Si Aïsid était là, malgré ça, pas d'app pour ça. Moi, pas d'app à terre pour ça. Il fait assez ou pas assez Il fait un pile pour pour. Il fait plus que maintenant Il fait pour un pile pour. Et ça fait, pour être pas ouais, pour avoir un Aïsid par lui-même. Qui est-ce que tu as gardé Qui est-ce que tu connais ça, ma petite Je ne suis pas un homme là. Parce que pour me souffrir à terre moi-même, je ne suis pas un homme là. Despite economic embargoes imposed from abroad, relentless attempts on his life, and ceaseless criticism leveled by foreign governments and wealthy elites, President Aristide is proud of what he was able to accomplish while in office. My predecessor had an embargo, economic embargo imposed on the country. And when I had that as a legacy, it was reinforced by the U.S. not willing my government to get the credit to implement social programs. Despite of that, we could do more than when Duvalier's regime for 30 years and others did in the past. In 190 years, we had only 34 secondary public schools. When we compare our mandates, 
we will realize we could move from 34 to 138 secondary public school. It was not normal after 200 years of independence to have only 1.5 Haitian doctors for each 11,000 people. Despite of the economic embargo, we invested in building a university. There we already have a medical school with 234 students. And unfortunately, they had to leave when the kidnapping or the coup d'etat happened last February. So we trust human beings. We invest in human beings. When you say what's Aristide's future, you're also saying what's Haiti's future. You know, it's not easy to, you know, erase people's memories. And the people who I'm around, you know, the patients, people in the hills, as you said, they're, you know, they're very attached to this guy and they're not going to forget about him. Aristide is a phenomenally charismatic person. Aristide could sit down and talk with you and you would believe him. Later on you'd say, but how could I believe that? Very often charismatic people get caught up in their own charisma and lose track of what is necessary on the ground. And I think that happened in the case of Aristide. Aristide's ascension was not this overnight fame of some actor playing out his life at that particular moment. Aristide's ascension was a manifestation of a yearning that people had, a desire that people had, a chance that they took, a risk that they took. And those are the, those are the real losers in the game. The, the cheap fix is not really going to work. Haiti needed considerable amount of funding from the international community to build up its justice system, to build up its, its internal security system, the police, whatever you want to call it, while the interim government was in place. The interim government has not been able to do any of this, and you're left with a situation where you're going to elect somebody, and that person is going to be pretty much in the position of Aristide, either in his first election or his second. That is not a, a good prospect. I wonder how some people will be able to look at themselves in a mirror one day. Their sons, their relatives, when they will be seeing what they did in 2004, how will they react? You can do your best to kill the truth, but you will not be able to kill it. The Haitian people, despite of so many people, thousands they were killed, although the United Nations are there, they continue to demonstrate in a non-violent way because they believe they are the future of their country. They will not wait for the world to give it as a gift to them, but they are doing their best to protect what they have to protect, freedom, democracy, dignity.